Okay. Now hopefully it's working. All right. So starting with a bit of a recap from last time, or kind of a recap of some of the basic things we've talked about so far. So the first object that we talked about was a set. Strictly speaking, a set has no definition for those of you who are here for set theory. Uh, but what's our intuition we give for what a set is? The intuition we give for what a set is, is it's an unordered, unique collection. That's our intuition. How do we represent a set? We do some squiggly bracket. We write some things that are comma separated in there, and we do an ending squiggly bracket. And so this is a set containing A, B, C. How many things are in that set? Three things are in that set. Wonderful. Here's another set. What is this set containing? It has five objects in there, right? The objects A, B, and C. How many distinct objects are in there? So this is a set only has three objects in it. These two sets are identical. So that's what we mean by a unique collection. By unique collection, we mean duplicates don't matter. And by unordered collection, we mean the order you write them in doesn't matter. And so this is also the same thing as a set CBA. Set is an unordered, unique collection. Now we have a very special kind of set that is ubiquitous in math. It's going to come up all the time, regardless of what field of math you go to. And we call that set a relation. What's a relation? It is a set of ordered pairs. It's a set where every object in the set is an ordered pair. Question, how many objects are in this set? Try again. Five? Don't you count ten? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, wait, but we have duplicate A's. No, 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 no. The objects in the set are the ordered pairs. There's the ordered pair, A, B. There's the ordered pair, B, A. Those are the objects in our set. So there's just five objects in that set. Every object in that set is an ordered pair. Therefore, it's called a relation. What's a relation? A set of ordered pairs. Now, so a relation is a special type of set. We're going to talk about a function, which is a special type of relation. Go ahead. No, because an ordered pair is different from a set. We call it an ordered pair. Why do we call it an ordered pair? Because it's one where order matters. And so the order pair, AB, is very different from the order pair, BA. A common example of where we use order pairs is in points on the plane. And the point 1, 5 is very different from the point 5, 1. If you go over 1 and up 5, that's very different from going over 5 and up 1. So order pairs, order matters. Set, order does not matter. Okay. So... We talked about sets. A relation is a special type of set. Now, a function is a special type of relation. And hopefully, you already have a lot of experience with functions. Let's give you a proper definition of what exactly a function is. What's a function? It's a relation such that every left-hand element is paired to a unique right-hand element. Question. Is this thing up here a function? Why not? Say that again? You're saying that backwards. I have AB and AC. Matters which way you say it. I have A goes to B and I have A goes to C. Not a function. What if I would have put SpongeBob here? Now is it a function? No. My problem is I still have A goes to B and A goes to SpongeBob. What if I would have put C here? Now is it a function? In a function, I can have C goes to SpongeBob? Isn't this a math class? I don't see why I can't either. Perfectly valid. 
So we're not limited by necessarily putting numbers into things. You always want numbers, numbers, numbers. There's all sorts of objects we can stick in there, including SpongeBob. All right, so that's a relation, that's a function. Oftentimes, we use a fancy f to represent a function. That fancy f we're saying is equal to this set of order pairs. Question, is f here a function? Yes? We have one goes to one and five goes to one. They both go to one. So what? Still a function. Right? Good. Each left-hand element goes to a unique right-hand element. One only goes to one thing. Two only goes to one thing. Three only goes to one thing. Four only goes to one thing. Five only goes to one thing. So it's a function. Now we have this special notation with a function. When I write f of 3, this means what is the right-hand thing that 3 was paired with? So if here's my function f, what is f of 3? 9. 9 is a thing that 3 was paired with. What's f of 1? 1. What's f of 5? 1. Let's pretend that this had a 1 goes to 6 in here. Is this now a function? No. So what would f of 1 be in this case? Yeah, a bunch of nonsense is what it is. It's undefined. It only makes sense if f is a function. We only use this notation for functions. So if we get rid of that again, f is now a function again. And f of 1 is back to 1. And we're all happy. OK. Uh, you know what the domain of a function is? Ever come across that before? Yeah. All the left-hand elements here, that's the domain of the function. And then you've probably heard about the range of a function. I'm going to say image. That's the more big boy word. Image and range, same thing. The image of the function is all the right-hand elements. Okay? So we have this special notation. This notation is going to kick your butt. F colon X arrow Y. What does that mean? It means F is a function from X to Y. It means F maps everything in X to something in Y. Your domain is X. And your image is a subset of Y. Maybe all of Y, maybe just a subset of Y. You are used to seeing functions from your algebra courses, something like f of x is equal to x squared, something like that, right? Now, they didn't, they didn't want to give you all of it in one go. They hide the fact from you that a proper way that we would write this function is to say f is a function from the real numbers to the real numbers by f of x is equal to x squared. Here's a proper way of writing it out. Here's what they show you to stop from giving you too much in one go. So here, your domain is the real numbers. You can plug any real number into there. But notice, what's your image? What's the image of this function? What are all the right-hand elements? Which numbers are those? Is 7 one of those? Yeah? What about 1 half? What about negative 1 half? All right. How do I get negative 1 half to come out of this? What's the x I can plug in so negative 1 half comes out? Negative 1 fourth, right? No, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> What's negative 1 fourth times negative 1 fourth? Positive 1 sixteenth. So we're not even close. So how do I get negative 1 half to come out of that function? I can't. So this function is all the positive real numbers, right? That would be its image. Its image is all the positive real numbers. Is that right? I wouldn't ask you unless it was wrong, right? Zero can be in it. Wonderful. 
So it's all the real numbers starting at zero onwards. Do you ever see interval notation? All the real numbers from zero comma to infinity like that? Or maybe they made you draw a picture on a real number line and they said zero is right here and you fill it in and then you fill in this side. Neither of those? Well, there's those. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is, wow, I forgot that I was using this because that's such garbage. So that's a little bit about domain and image, or domain and range. So when you see that f is a function from x to y, it maps everything in x to something in y. The domain is always all of x. The image is just a subset of y. Could be all of y, could just be some of y. In the case we just did, it was just the positive real numbers, including 0. It wasn't mapping to all the real numbers. OK. So there's that. We call it the co-domain. Co-domain, but that's terminology you hardly ever have to use. But that is what it's called. OK. So now some properties that these functions can have. If f is a function from x to y, then we say that it's 1 to 1. I'm going to write that as 1 dash 1 because I'm really lazy. 1 to 1. Have you ever talked about a 1 to 1 function before? Going back to your graph, you were probably told something like this. You were told it's a function if it passes the vertical line test, which is every input goes to one output. You were told it's a one-to-one -one function if it passes a horizontal line test. So this function is not one-to-one -one because you can draw a horizontal line through it at two points. This over here, we're just drawing the function x squared. Over here, we wrote x cubed in a terrible way. This one is a function, and it's also a one-to-one -one function. That might have been how you saw it before. Let me give you another way that we say it. Going back to our function up here, notice that every input had a unique output. Every left-hand element had a unique right-hand element. But not every right-hand element came from a unique left-hand element. We had one came from 5 and one came from 1. So this is an example of a function that is not 1 to 1. If instead I made 5 here go to 6, now it is a 1 to 1 function. Say it again. Put that back as 1. This is a function. How do I know that this is a function? Because 1 only ever goes to one number, namely 1. 2 only ever goes to one number, namely 4. 3 only goes to 9. 4 only goes to 16. 5 only goes to 1. So every left-hand element, namely 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, goes to a unique number. You, if I were to write f of, and I put any number here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you instantly know what it is. Right? That's what it means to be a function. But notice now, 1 goes to 1 and 5 goes to 1. Since we have two left-hand elements pairing to the same right-hand element, then we say that it is not a 1 to 1 function. It is still a function, it's just not 1 to 1. So 1 to 1 is a special property on top of being a function. So you know something's a function, an extra thing you can check is, is it a 1 to 1 function? Now let's say in big boy language. The function is 1 to 1 if and only if. The inputs being equal implies the outputs are equal. If x is equal to y, then f of x is equal to f of y. If you give, have the same input, then you get the same output. This function is not one-to-one -one because here we have the same. My arrow's going the wrong way. I don't want to write an implication arrow the other way, so I need to erase this. Thank you. I said that backwards. If and only if the output being equal implies the inputs are equal. 
So going back up to our function here, here's f. We already know this isn't one to one. Let me try and connect it with the definition here. What is f of one equal to? What is f of five equal to? So notice that f of one is equal to f of five. Is one equal to five? No, so it does not satisfy this implication. It's one to one only if it always satisfies this implication. If the outputs being equal always implies the inputs are equal. Go ahead. Well, if we put an arrow here, it would go both ways. It's one to one if it satisfies this property, and it satisfies this property if it's one to one. That's the if and only if there. Used to if and only if? <laughs> uh, you guys are starting with us too late. We need to go back over propositional logic. But you'll pick up on a lot of it as we go. Okay. So that's one property a function can have. It can be one to one. Another property it can have is it can be on two. So a function is on two if spelled with two f's is a stand in for if and only if. So a function is on two if and only if f of big X, the domain, is equal to big Y, the codomain. Or in other words, if we use up this whole set, our image is the entire set. Going back to uh, your grade school stuff, x squared here, notice it's a parabola like this, right? It's never negative. So its codomain, if we were to write out our function, f of x, sorry, f is a function from the real numbers to the real numbers by f of x is equal to x cubed. Oops, x squared. So that gives us this one, right? Notice that we don't use up all the real numbers in our output. We only use some of them. So this is not on 2. On the other hand, if we were looking at a cubic, now a cubic, roughly speaking, looks like this. And this one does give us all the outputs. So a cubic is on two. A quadratic, a parabola, is not on two. Make sense? And then finally, the last property we have on functions is we call them a bijection. What does it mean for a function to be a bijection? It means it has both these properties. It's one to one and it's on two. That's what it means to be a bijection. Any questions about any of those? Go ahead. What's the previous one? This one? So when you see f colon x arrow y, or in other words, you see f colon some set arrow some set, that means that f is a function from x to y. The domain is x, and the image, or the range, is a subset of y. Maybe all of y, maybe not. So that's how we would read this. The way we read it is f is a function from x to y. And the way I'm going to say it over and over again is f maps everything in x to something in y. Thing is, well, you know, to a capital letter, to a oh, thank you. Common notation. When I use capital letters, I'll be talking about sets. When I use lowercase letters, I'll be talking about members of sets. So yeah, that could be very confusing when you see this versus this. Here I'm saying when we map the entire domain, we get the entire codomain. When we map all of that set, we get all of that set, not just some of it. That's what it means to be on two. Any more questions about that? Are we ready for an example? Let's hop into the example. So, nice, simple, discrete example. We have big X here as a set, one, two, three, four. We have big Y as a set, A, B, C, D. And I have my function F there. Question, is F one to one? Well, let's start with, is it a function? 
Is f a function? Is it a function from x to y? Does it map everything in x to something in y? Yes. So it is a function from x to y. Is it one to one? Is it on two? Yes. Let's mess with it. If I replace this d with a c, now question, is it still a function? Yes. Is it a function from x to y still? You sure? Where do we use d? We don't, and we don't have to. We mapped everything in this set to something in this set. Is this function one to one? No. Is it on two? No, we're missing D. All right. Well, if we could just get rid of that element altogether. Okay, that should fix it. All right. So now, is this a function from X to Y? Yes, right? What? We got to know. Why not? Because there's no 4. What does it mean to be a function from x to y? It means we map everything in x to something in y. Did we map everything in x? No, so this is not a function from x to y. It's a function. It's just not a function from x to y. Dense notation. So this notation is very dense. It's going to be a notation that kicks you in the butt over and over again. It's saying a lot. It's easy to lose track of what it's saying. Okay. Now, function composition. You go over that before? Compose functions together? All right. Let's go over function composition. So now let f be a function from x to y. x and y are sets. f maps everything in x to something in y. And g now is a function from y to z. It maps everything in y to something in z. So we're talking about three sets, two functions. Right? OK. Then the composition of g with f is the function, we write it this way, g composed with f. That is going to be a function from x to z given by g composed with f of little x is g of f of x. That's notation, but it's kind of a simple concept. We're just doing two functions in one go. So let's manually work out some of these in a concrete example, then go over the definition again, and I think you'll get it. So let's say that x is a set 1, 2, 3, 4. y is a set a, b, c, d. And z is a set point, line, segment, triangle, square. So there's our three sets. f, remember we want f to be a function from x to y. So I'm going to set f up so it's a function from x to y. It's going to map 1 to d, 2 to b, 3 to a, 4 to c. Did I cheat or is f a function from x to y? Is it a function from x to y? Is it 1 to 1? Is it on 2? Is it a bijection? OK, good. So here's our function f. Here's our function g. g maps a to triangle, b to line segment, c to square, d to point. Right? OK, so now we're going to work out g composed with f of something. The something that we can plug into this is the same thing that we can plug into f. What are all the things we can plug into f? I didn't mean to put an a there. What are all the things we can plug into f? One, two, three, and four. So those are the only things I can plug into g composed with f. It's the same things I can plug into that right-hand function. Let's plug something in to see what we get. So what's g composed with f of one? Well, by definition, G composed with F of something is the same thing as G of F of that something. So G composed with F of 1 is G of F of 1. 
That's just plugging in our definition. G composed of F of something is G of F of that something. Right? Now, notice what is F of 1? D. What's F of 1? D. Remember what this question is asking. What is the right-hand element of 1 in F? And the answer is D. So this is the same thing as G of D. What is G of D? Dot. So G composed with F of 1 is dot. What's another thing we could plug into this function? 2. So let's plug 2 in here. What is G composed with F of 2? It's the same thing as G of F of 2. Now what's F of 2? B. And what's G of B? Line segment. And so G composed with F of 2 is line segment. So you just plug it into one function, get the result, plug it into the other. So it's like we're combining two functions into one. That's what function composition pretty much does. It's a lot like addition on the real numbers. What does addition do? It takes two real numbers and combines them into one. Function composition takes two functions and combines them into one. All right, let's plug four in here. So, G composed of F of 4 is the same thing as G of F of 4. And what's F of 4? C. And what's G of C? Square. So, G composed with F of 4 is square. All right, let's draw this out pictorially, and hopefully that will help you make connections as well. And then we'll go back one more time and read the definition. So, over here, we're going to write what F did, and over here, we're going to write what G did. So F, what did F map 1 to? D. So F took 1 and mapped it to D. What did F map 2 to? B. What did F map 3 to? And what did F map 4 to? So that's what F did. What did G do? What did G map A to? And what did it map B to? And what did it map C to? And what did it map D to? And so now, G composed with F is a function that just does all these in one go. It took one and mapped it to dot. It took 2 and mapped it to line segment. It took 4 and mapped it to square. That's all function composition is doing. Take the two functions and hook them together. Cut out the middle guy. Make sense? All right, let's read the definition now one more time. Hopefully you get it. Let f be a function from x to y and g be a function from y to z. Then the composition of g with f is a function g composed with f. Notice it's a function from x now to z. So we skip over y, because that's where we glued them together. It was on y. So it's a function g composed with f from x to z by g composed with f of x is g of f of x. Exactly what we were plugging in right here. That makes sense? OK, that's a tough definition. We'll see how much it sticks with you. OK. Let's do some concrete examples now. Uh, with examples that you know and love from algebra. So here, we're assuming that f is a function from the real numbers to the real numbers, and g is a function from the real numbers to the real numbers. And f of x is that function given by 3 of x squared. G is a function given by 5 minus 2x. Let's make sure we understand these functions. Really quick, what is f of 1? 3. How did he get that? 
you plug in, if we plug in one for x, we plug in one for x. So it's three times one squared. What's one squared? One multiplied by three is three. All right, let's try another one. What's f of one half? Yeah, it's three times one half squared. A half times a half is a whole. Not even close. You have half a pizza, and then I take half of your half. How much pizza do you have? One fourth. So we have three times one fourth. Or in other words, we have three quarters. Let's try one more. What's f of pi equal to? It's what? It's 29.6 what? 0, 8, 8, what? 1, 3, 2, that's what it is? No, we're still off by infinitely many digits. There's no such thing as close enough. I want the answer. What is it? Three it's 3 pi squared. You guys kill yourself with those calculators. I don't need decimal approximations of these things. I need the answer. OK. So I think you got the hang of that function. Do we need to do the other function, or you think you got it? You think you got it? All right, so now let's figure out g composed with f of x. What is g composed with f of x equal to? It's equal to g of f of x. But what is f of x equal to? 3x squared. So it's g of 3x squared. What's that equal to? Five minus two of that thing, right? If we plug that in for x into g, we plug it in for x into g, right? So then you work out the algebra, and it's five minus six x squared, right? Let's try the other one. Let's look at f composed with g. What does that equal? It equals f of g of x, which is equal to f of, what's g of x? 5 minus 2x. OK, what's that equal to? We are replacing x in f with 5 minus 2x. So if I'm going to plug it in for x there, i got to plug it in for x there. So this is equal to 3 times 5 minus 2x all squared. We can leave it at that. We don't need to multiply it out. That's a simplified as we're going to get. Is this function the same as this function? We just have to rework it a little bit, then it's the same, right? No, they are not the same function. They're very different functions. Let's plug in a number. When you plug in 0 to this function, what do you get? When you plug 0 into this function, what do you get? 5. If I replace my x with 0, with 0 squared, what's 6 times 0? What's 5 minus 0? All right, you did it. What do I get if I plug in 0 for x down here? 15? Bunch of wrong answers. 20 is how much closer. 75. <laughs> Plug in 0 for x. What's 2 times 0? 0. What's 5 minus 0? What's 5 squared? 
times 3, 75. So we get very different answers when we plug in 0. These are very different functions. F composed with G is not the same thing as G composed with F. Very different functions. Good? Okay. Uh, will you double check on that and see if you can see this line? Okay, thank you. Next definition. What does it mean for a set to be finite? A set X is finite if it is empty, so there's nothing in it, or if there exists some N... Uh-oh. Are you guys comfortable with... Tell me which of these symbols you haven't seen before. This was an M with two lines. Didn't draw it very well. Have you seen this before? It's not zero. Well, we won't confuse you. It's the empty set. It's a set with nothing in it. Does not mean zero. It does, but it doesn't. He knows it does, but you should never think that. <laughs> That'll confuse you. For now, it's just the empty set. All right. What about this? No. This is the natural numbers. This is shorthand for the set containing 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, dot, dot. You do an N. Yeah, that's kind of a dead spot on the board. You do an N, and then just give it an extra line down the middle. All right. That's the naturals. The Z here, Z for... Z integers. And you know what the integers are? All the negative whole numbers, zero, and all the positive whole numbers. All right. And then Q is obviously for the rationals. We couldn't use R because we use that for reals. So what comes after R? S. But the rationals are before. So we use Q. <laughs> you thinking yet? All right. What are the rational numbers? Tell it to me like I'm a third grader. Go ahead. Anything that can be written as uh, a. Anything that can be written as a over b. All right. Pi over the square root of two. Is that rational? Not by a mile. Try again. Well, mile and a half. Go ahead. Integers. Yes, any quotient of integers, A over B, where there's a restriction on B, can't be zero. So any quotient of integers where the denominator is not zero. So like negative 3 over 2, perfectly valid. That's what we mean by the rationals. And then the reals are pretty much what you think of as any number. Do you know what a complex number is? Uh, kind, of. kind of, but no. If it's no, then great. So anything you think of as a number is a real number. In other words, we're not including the square root of negative 1. Okay. So those are those sets. All right, so let's read this definition again. And when you see me put a sign up here, a plus like that, that means just the positive integers. And if you see me do a negative sign up here, that means just the negative numbers, negative integers. Same with real numbers. If I put a plus there, just positive real numbers, negative, same with on the rationals. We never do that with the naturals. So let's read this again. A set X is finite if it's empty or if there exists some positive integer and some bijection f from the set 0, 1, 2, all the way up to that positive integer, and x. If we can find a bijection that does that, then the set x is finite. Now, that, once again, might sound like a mouthful. So let's make it make sense. Let's do a concrete example really quick. We'll use a space over here. 
So I'm going to give you a set. A, B, C. Is that set finite? Looks like it. How would we prove it? We would need to be able to find some integer n, some positive integer n, such that using all the numbers up to that n, we can create a bijection between it and x. So in this case, our n is going to be 2. And so our set, 0, 1, dot, 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 all the way up to n, is just going to be the set 0, 1, 2. Can I create a bijection from this set to this set? Yes, I have 0 goes to a, 1 goes to b, 2 goes to c. Therefore, this set is finite. This is intuitively how we count sets. Not how we count sets, how we see how big sets are. I uh, have to go over what we talked about last time. Talking about the cardinality of a set, the size of a set, how could you determine if two sets are the same size? If I had a bunch of boys in here and a bunch of girls in here, and I said, I want you to figure out Thinking about the set of boys and the set of girls. I say, I want you to figure out, are there the same many boys as there are girls? How would you do it? You can count them. That's one way to do it. You go into the blah, 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 and hope you don't make a mistake. But you say, everyone pair up. And if you could perfectly pair everyone up or create a bijection between them, then they're the same size. And if you can't, then they're not the same size. Right? That's what a bijection is. It's a pairing off just like that. So if I can pair this set off with some other set that counts up to n, in other words, this set eventually ends, doesn't matter if the number is 10,567, if I can come up with some set here where I can create a perfect pairing with x, then x must be finite. Or in other words, I could count all the things in x. If I start my counting at zero, we could have just as easily did one, two, dot, 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 all the way up to n, same thing. Well, if I can call something the zeroth element, the first, the second, the third, dot, 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 all the way up to n, then it must be finite. All right, guess what we call a set that's not finite? Infinite, yes. So a set that is not finite is infinite. Got that? Cool. Okay, next, a set is countably infinite if there exists a bijection between that set and the natural numbers. Last time we proved that the integers were a countable set. We came up with a bijection from the naturals to the integers. You might remember that from last time. When I was showing you that there's so many naturals as there are integers. You might want to go back and watch that if that sounds crazy to you. Shouldn't there be half as many naturals as there are integers? Because the naturals just have zero in the positive whole numbers. The integers have all those negatives. So there's way more integers. Oh, so infinite to infinite? All right, let's talk about some of these sets. What's bigger out of those two, or are they the same size? The naturals and the integers. They're both infinite. Are they the same size? I just told you they are. Yes, they have the same cardinality. The way we prove it is we do a pairing off. And I did that at the end of last class. I showed how to create a bijection between these two sets. So I can map everything in here to one and only one thing in there. If these were your girls and these were your guys, I showed you how to perfectly pair them off. So everyone gets paired to exactly one person. And no one gets missed. So you want to see that? That was at the end of last class. It's on the YouTube series. You can go watch it. So those two are the same size. They're both infinite. What about these two? The naturals and the rationals. Are those the same size? Well, think about this for a second. If we're looking at the naturals, so like 0, 1, 2, how many naturals are there between 1 and 2? How many natural numbers are there between 1 and 2? None. How many rationals are there between 1 and 2? Infinite. So just between 1 and 2, there's, infinitely num there's infinite numbers. So what's bigger out of these two? 
The rationals are way bigger. Well, in other words, they're really the same size. I didn't prove that to you, but I can. So these are actually the same size. What about these two? The naturals and the reals, what do you think? Same size, not same size? They're both infinite. And this time, they're not the same size. And that should in no way be intuitive. So it turns out this set is the same size as this set, is the same size as this set, but they're all different sizes from this set. Although they're all infinite. And so the size of the reals is a whole new infinity. And if you want a proof for that, it's somewhere in computation theory. It's not that hard of one to prove. We could prove it if you really want, but it'd have to be a high level proof. So, infinity isn't just infinity. There's lots of infinities. Guess how many there are? There's 10. <laughs> and then some. All right. Uh, I lost where we were. Countable versus uncountable. Okay. So the size of these sets, the infinity that those sets are, we call the countably infinite. So these sets are all countably infinite. So a set is countable if there is, exists a bijection between it and the natural numbers. Or in other words, if it's the same size as the natural numbers, we call it countably infinite. Sometimes the natural numbers are referred to as the countable numbers. Or the counting numbers. That's where that name's coming from. And then if a set isn't countable, then we call it uncountable. R is uncountable. You can't count the real numbers. You can count each of these. Okay. Uh, theorem. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll just move the camera. I don't know if I'd lose that. Never mind. We'll keep scribbling here. All right, there. We're not going to prove this one. We're just going to try and make sure you have intuition for it. So first one. A subset of a finite set is finite. If I start out with a finite set and I take a subset of it, that subset must have still been finite. Couldn't have somehow become infinite. Next. A finite union of a finite of finite sets is finite. You know what a union is? Unioning sets together? Uh, you can call it joining, but it's called a union. So if this is A and this is B, the union of A and B is everything that's in either of them. Right? And so if I have a finite set, union together with a finite set, union together with a finite set, union together with a finite set, and I do that a finite number of times, and it's all said and done, I'm left with a, a finite set. OK. Next one. A finite product of finite sets is finite. Product of sets. We'll have to recover that with you guys when we get to it. Or you go back and watch the lectures to get that one. I think you only missed three, so. All on YouTube, double speed. You can crank through it. You'll be fine. Yes, cross product between sets. OK. And then repeat all these again, except for replace finite with countable. A subset of a countable set is countable. A countable union of countable sets is countable. Uh, how can we give intuition for that one? Uh, one intuition you could get is thinking about the fact that there's a countable number of integers, and then between each integer there's a countable number of rationals. And if we keep unioning those up, we're always still in a countable realm. And then finally, a countable product of countable sets is still countable. 
What proof any of those? Right, so there is a difference between finite and infinite. Yes. Finite means I can pick some number and say it's exactly that big. Countable means, like the naturals, are our uh, go to countable set. Because essentially, you can count it forever, and count it forever, and finite is a way to just count it. Yes. Okay. Next one. Sequence. Okay, that's right. Sequence. Sequence is another one of these ones that the definition is always a pain to understand, but the concept is pretty simple. So let me give you intuition for what a sequence is really quick. I'm really going to want to move this because that's part of the example there. Okay, I think we're good. I have all three of them. Okay, uh, a sequence. A sequence is just an ordered listing of numbers that never ends. So I could do one, two, three, four, dot, 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 going on forever. That's a sequence of numbers. And in that sequence, notice one came before two. Order mattered. Three came before four. One came before four. A subsequence, so if this is my sequence, a subsequence is where I pick terms out of here, but still maintain the order. So this could have gone on to five, six, seven, eight, nine. Dot, dot, dot. Maybe in my subsequence, I just want the odds. So then I do one, three, seven, Five, nine, eleven, right? No, I changed the order. So this is not a subsequence. It has to have the five before the seven, since five came before the seven in our initial sequence. That's all a sequence is. It's a listing of numbers in order. Okay, now let's give you the proper definition. That's just intuition, make you feel good. Like, oh yeah, that's obvious. And then it comes back to bite. A function from the positive integers, so from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, blah, 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 2x is a sequence in x. Let me give you an example of a sequence we could have made over here. Say, for example, I want to list all the perfect squares. We could do that as a sequence, right? 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, etc., right? Perfectly valid sequence. If this is my sequence, since 1 came first, this is what I'm mapping 1 to. I map 2 to this, 3 to this, 4 to this, 5 to this, 6 to this, etc. So let's see it again. A function f from the positive integers to x is a sequence in x. Let's write out some examples, writing them out completely fully, and then you'll understand why I use that notation instead. So let's write it out very explicitly. Here's a function from the positive integers to the positive integers. So it's going to be a sequence in the positive integers. And by f of x is equal to x squared. So what does 1 map to? One. What does 2 map to? What does 3 map to? What does 4 map to? What does 5 map to? What does 6 map to? And we could go on and on. 
And notice that when we're following a simple pattern like this, since I mapped 1 to something, I mapped 2 to something, I mapped 3 to something, I mapped 4 to something, I mapped 5 to something, I mapped 6 to something, if I want a shorthand notation for this, if I put whatever 1 went to first, put whatever 2 went to second, put to whatever 3 went to third, then we can write it out like this and we don't lose any information. If you're looking at this and I ask you what did 6 go to, Yeah, you count over to the sixth spot and you say it went to 36. And so its order here is mapping, matching what it went to over here. So this is a special notation we use for sequences because this is very tedious. This is positive integers. Positive integers starts at 1, natural starts at 0. Okay, let's look at G. G now is a function from the positive integers to the positive rationals. So it's a sequence in the positive rationals. Read our definition one more time. A function f from the positive integers to x is a sequence in x. Okay, let's look at G. What does 1 go to? It goes to 1. What does 2 go to? What does 3 go to? What does 4 go to? And we can keep going on as long as we want. Again, that's really tedious. So if you were to talk about the sequence 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, everyone would understand what you were talking about. Captures the same information. Good? Now, sometimes, not sometimes, to make it clear that we're talking about a sequence, instead of ever using f of x, we always use f of n when we're talking about a sequence. So in general, if you see f of x, not f of x, in general when you see f of n, it's understood that that function's domain is the positive integers. So if I were talking about the sequence f of x equals x squared or g of x equals 1 over x, I wouldn't have actually written it that way, and you'd never see it that way. You see it this way. f of n equals n squared, and f of n equals 1 over n. Or g of n, I mean. And that's how we write out sequences. And so the same way that when you see f of x, is equal to x squared in your algebra books. You knew that that was from the real numbers to the real numbers, and I didn't need to say that for you. You now know that when you see f of n equals 1 over n, this is from the positive integers to the rationals. And you can infer it from context. Oftentimes you'll be able to infer it from context, but uh, that's the difference in notation we often use. Okay. And then I already explained to you how we drop all the left-hand elements and just write out the right-hand elements. It's understood that's what 1 went to, that's what 2 went to, that's what 3 went to, that's what 4 went to, that's what 5 went to. Or sometimes to write really succinctly, if it has a nice clearing pattern, oops, if it has a nice clean pattern, we just write whatever the pattern is in parentheses. And now if you want to know what 1 goes to, you just plug it in. What 2 goes to, you plug it in. And so we'll often refer to something in parentheses like that as a sequence. If I want to talk about some generic sequence that we have no clue what it is, I'll talk about the sequence x sub n. That just means some generic sequence. I have no clue what it is. The same way that we might use f sub x for some random function. What function is that? I don't know. It's a function. Okay. The hard one. Subsequence. Okay. About to go over our definition with the subsequence for you. In this definition, y sub n is going to be a subsequence of x sub n. So you start out with some sequence x sub n. x sub n is 1 over n. 
So one over one, one over two, one over three, dot, 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 there's x over n. Y over n, I designed it so that it's a subsequence of x of n. I took the first term from x of n, the fourth term, the ninth term, I would have taken the 16th term if I had written it, and I'm creating a subsequence here, right? And this other sequence is keeping track of what my choices were in my subsequence. We call this the indexing sequence. Here's my initial sequence. Here's my subsequence. Here's my sequence that told me which numbers I chose in my subsequence. I chose the first, the fourth, the ninth, etc. Okay. Sequence, subsequence, indexing sequence. Now I'm going to read that definition. It's going to sound like a whole bunch of gibberish. Try and make a click in your head. A sequence, y sub n, is a subsequence of x sub n, provided that, ever seen that before? There exists. <laughs> it means there exists. There exists k1, k2, k3, k4, dot, 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 infinitely many k's in the positive integers with k1 being less than k2, being less than k3, being less than k4. We're defining this sequence right here. k1, k2, k3, k4, k5, da, 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 da. Such that y sub n is equal to x sub k sub n. Let's make sense of that. So y sub 3, looking at our concrete sequence, is equal to x sub k sub 3 is equal to x sub, what's k sub 3? 9. What's x sub 9? 1 9th. So the third term in y is 1 9th. Told you, subsequences, really easy to get intuition for. You look at that definition, and it's a big pain. Right, which is ordered pairs? Technically, this is a list of ordered pairs. Right? And that's what I'm saying. Why don't you just write another one? And putting them out. Uh, no, no, no. I'm saying y sub n by itself is already in order to This is shorthand for, if we were to write that out explicitly, it's the function 1 goes to 1 over 1. 2 goes to 1 over 4. 3 goes to 1 over 9. Etc. Yeah, I'm asking what the value of put out is there. I did, this, this is not a split off from this. It's Look, its terms are 1, 4, and 9. I get that they're... Uh, I don't know how you mean write those as an ordered pair. I should say that. Of having them written out. I just don't really know how you combine it in the way you're thinking. Well, the way you wrote that there. So you're saying you want y sub n to be written as... Uh, 1 goes to 1, comma, 4 goes to 1 fourth, like that? Oh, I'm not following you then. Literally, though, I was just curious as to the way you just barely about it, right about where you're writing it. Yep. Why is that not that easier to read? This is just a shorthand way to write the same thing. But then you have to then uh, create a whole other list, or a uh, whole list of the key. No, this key is just saying how you reference it to the initial sequence. I, okay. This is saying it, up here, we took the first term, the fourth term, the ninth term from the sequence that we're saying it's a subsequence of. I get that. So we're just tracking the indexes that these came from. And you're saying down there is not the... Down here, we're not tracking the indexes that they came from. 
one, four, nine. Four and nine aren't listed here. One, two, three. I don't. Or, oh, oh, Those oh, are oh, very oh. different numbers. Yeah, no. What I'm saying is, why not set the, the first element? What so you mean add? switch this to four? Yes. Yeah. And switch this to nine. Exactly. All right. Okay. Okay. Now it's not a sequence. You're right. It's not. But at the same time, why not write it that way? Now it's not even a sequence. What's our definition of a sequence? So to maintain, we want a subsequence to still be a sequence. Okay, so you want a sequence of the and a sequence of the. You can keep track of this if you care about it, but it's just what we call it. Okay. Okay. So that sequences and subsequences. It'll be a while before we have to see those again. But yeah, one of those things. Easy to get the intuition for it. Definition, big pain. That's how a lot of this class is going to be. Okay, so that ends the preliminary stuff. And now we're ready to start with topology proper. Chapter 1.1 of our book. By the way, the book is available for you on the Facebook page. I have a PDF uploaded, so you can get it. So, try to get you everything you need. All right. Uh... Topological space. Now we're in section 1.1. Start the book. So, topology, the reason that this stuff isn't very intuitive is because it's one of the few times that we're, uh, how's the best way to say this? I'm not going to have a good way to say it. Let me tell you what this definition enables us to do. And it's going to be in no way intuitive that it enables us to do it, but it does. You know what a continuous function is? A continuous function? In short, topologies give us a nice way of talking about continuity. Continuous functions. That's a massive part of topology. Talk about continuous functions. And now you're used to the notion that a continuous function is one that you can draw without lifting up your pencil, right? But how do you create a continuous function from the set 1, 2, 3, 4 to the set uh, dot line segment triangle square? Is it even possible to create a continuous function from that set to that set? Yeah? How? How do I draw a function with this as its domain and this as its range in a continuous way? Right, this notion of just don't pick up your pencil doesn't work anymore. Sure, that works when you're mapping real numbers to real numbers on the real number coordinate system. But what about if we are mapping integers to integers on the real number coordinate system? Now, when you plot an integer, you plot a point, then plot a point, then plot a point, then plot a point. You definitely can't do that without picking up your pencil. Is it continuous? Is there any way to create continuous functions from the integers to the integers? From the naturals to the naturals? From the integers to the reals? Hmm. So that's what topology gets at at its heart, is how to talk about continuity. And it turns out a huge part of that comes from this definition. And it's not going to be even remotely obvious how this definition helps us with continuity. But it does. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> it's not as simple as finding a pattern. It comes from a topology. It's not going to be at all intuitive or obvious how this helps, and so it's not at all intuitive or obvious how we create continuous functions on these other sets. So you just got to take it by the horns. There's no tips. There's no tricks. There's no secrets. You just have to understand this. So let's understand this. All right, definition. First definition in the book. Let X be a set. A topology, we'll typically use a tau, Greek letter tau, to represent our topology. A topology tau on X is a collection of subsets of X. We call them open sets. When I do S dot T dot, that means such that. Such that these three properties hold for tau. So I've got my set X. Tau is a collection of subsets of X with these three properties being satisfied. And that's what gives us a topology. All right, what's the first property? 
The first property is that the empty set and the entire set X are open sets. Or in other words, the empty set is in tau and the entire set X is in tau. Number two, the intersection of finitely many open sets is an open set. Or in other words, if A1, A2, A3, A4, dot, 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 AN are all in tau, then their entire intersection is also in tau. And then finally, the union of any collection of open sets is an open set. Or in other words, if we have some arbitrary collection of open sets, where each one of those open sets are in tau, then their union is also in tau. Now that's a giant mouthful. We're going to go over a bunch of examples with really simple sets to try and develop some intuition for what a topology is. So <laughs> let's start with this example. We're going to have x be the set ABC and tau be the set containing the empty set, the set containing A, the set containing B, and the set containing ABC. The question is, is tau a topology on X? Let's check our three properties. First off, is the empty set in tau? Yes, right there. Is X in tau? It is? Yeah, right here, that's X. X is a set ABC. There's a set ABC, that's in tau. So we satisfy property one. Property one says the empty set and the entire set X are open sets, or in other words, they're in tau. The empty set open? Yes, it's in tau. Is that set open? Yes, it's in tau. What does number two say? Number two says any finite intersection of sets in tau is also in tau. Let's see. What's the intersection of the empty set and the set containing A? Guys, no intersection? Am I asking a question that just doesn't make sense? Let's draw a picture for intersection really quick. Here's my set A. Here's my set B. The intersection is what's in both. Okay, there's intersection. Let's go back to this. What's the intersection of the empty set and the set containing A? The empty set. If we look at everything that's in here, intersected with everything that's in here, what do we get? I want the set of everything that's in here and in here. There it is. That's a set of everything that's in here and in here. So, what's the intersection of the empty set and the set containing A? The empty set, is that in there? Yeah. What's the intersection of those two sets? The empty set. What's the intersection of the set containing A and the set containing B? The empty set. There's always an intersection. If you intersect two sets, you always have a set. It's never nothing. The same way that when you multiply two numbers together, it's always a number. The number might be zero, and that's okay. Six times zero isn't nothing. Six times zero is zero. Any set intersected the empty set isn't nothing. It's the empty set. All right, so the set containing A intersect the set containing B is the empty set. What's the set of everything that's in both of those? That's the set containing nothing or the empty set. What about if we intersect those two? All right. Let's write this one out. So we have the set A, B, C, and the intersected with the set containing B. I want the set of everything that's in both of those. Is A in both of them? No, is B in both of them? Yes, is C in both of them? Okay, so we got the set containing B. So the set containing A, B, C intersected with the set containing B is the set containing B, right? If I intersect those two together, I just get the set containing A. 
If I intersect those two together, I just get the empty set. If I intersect that, that, and that, and that all together, what do I get? I get the empty set. What's everything that's in all those sets? The empty set. Right? It doesn't matter what combination of sets I pick in tau. If I take their intersection, I get another set in tau. What's this set intersected with this set? What do I get if I intersect a set with itself? You get the set itself. Right? So this intersected with this, it's right there. So you can pick the same set twice, that's fine. Pick any combination of sets you want out of here, intersect them together, and you still have a set inside of here. That's what the second property says. The intersection of finitely many open sets is an open set. What does it mean to be an open set? It means it's in tau. The sets in tau are open sets. So it means to be an open set, you're in the topology. That's so all it means to be an open set. What does it mean to be closed set here? Your complement is open, but we'll come to that. Let's see. Next one, the union. The union of any arbitrary collection of sets is an open set. Let's check that. Let's union these up and see what we get. What happens if I union those two together? What do I get? The set with A, B, and C. What if I union those two together? What if I union those two together? What if I union those together? What if I union those together? So it doesn't matter how I union them together, I always get another set inside of there, right? Um, what about C? Oh, yeah, of course, it's not individual. I have to pick a set in there. I have to pick sets in there and union them together. So I can union any of these sets together, and I always get another set in there, right? 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 I would ask that many times unless it was wrong. What do I get if I union A, the second thing A, and the second thing B together? What's the union of these two? What's everything that's in here or here? Right. Where's the second thing A and B? So, the second containing A. Union together with the set containing B is equal to the set containing everything that's in here or in here. A, B. Is the set containing A, B in here? No. So this is not topology. Okay, let's put that set in here. Now is it topology? No, because we don't have the set just containing C now. Right? What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> Think about the definition rather than guessing based off of the tone of my voice if it's true or false. Let's check again. Is the empty set in here? That's good. Is the entire set X in here? That's good. Is the intersection of any choices I make of those sets also a set in there? What's the intersection of those two? A, B, and C. The intersection. A, B. Just A, B. Right. What's the intersection of these ones? B, B. Those ones. Yeah. Those ones. Yeah. Those ones. Yeah. We already checked it. Okay. So it looks like we can take the intersection, right? Let's look at unions. Is there any unions I can take of those sets to get something that's not one of those sets? I don't know if you ever really find how to describe what an open set was. This is the first time we're describing it in detailed manner. Okay. What is an open set? It's a member of a topology. Okay, so every single one of those elements are an open set? This is an open set, 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 this is an open set. And it, they're all open sets because... Because they're in a topology. Topology, and it's because it's, 
as a body to the domain all of you. Yes. Is this a topology? Anyone figure out what we're missing? The set containing C, why do we need that? Oh, well, if you do the intersection. Did you see it? What is it? You have the union of two of these sets, you might not have Well, you'd have a tough time wording it because this is a topology. We don't need the second team seat. No, we're good. That's a topology. It is very confusing. So you've got to go back to the definition. Don't count your intuition. There's no reason that you look at that and just say, oh, yeah, that's an open set for sure, or that's a topology for sure. You're going to have to stop and think about it. And the only way to stop and think about it is to systematically look at all these things. All right, we're going to look at some more examples, this time more pictorially, hopefully develop a little bit of intuition. So once again, our set is going to be A, B, C. And I've pictorially written out three potential topologies. Tau 1, tau 2, tau 3. Where a circle represents one of the sets in tau. So this circle means that it has a set A, B, C. This circle means it has a set AB. This circle means it has a set A. And we're going to assume, since there's not really a good way to draw it, we're going to assume it always has the empty set. So here's a circle for the empty set for each of them. There it is. There it is. There it is. OK, they all have the empty set. You with me? All right, so let's start with tau 1 and see if this is a topology. Step 1, does it have the empty set? Yep, right there. Does it have the entire set x? Yes, that's this circle right here. All right, so. We're good on property one. Property two. Does the intersection of any of those sets give you one of those sets? Yeah, because they're just nested. What happens if I intersect this set with this set? I just get this set. What happens if I intersect this set with this set? I just get this set. What happens if I intersect this set with this set? I just get that set. So well, they're just nested. So yeah, the intersection's always there. What about the union? What do I get if I union this set with this set? It's right here. What happens if I union this set with this set? It's right here. Right? Doesn't matter how I union those up, I get one of those sets. Doesn't matter how you intersect them, I get one of those sets. So nested sets, really easy to work with. So yes, this one is a topology. Check. I want to give you two topologies in a row. Let's check the next one. All right, here's our messiest one. So let's check our list. Do we have the empty set? Do we have the whole set? OK. Yeah, that's this circle. Yeah. All right. Next, do we have the intersection of any of the sets? Can you find any sets that we can intersect together and end up with something that's not in the set? Hmm. Let's play with some. What happens if I intersect the set BC with the set just B? I just get B. Oh, we're good. What happens if I union A with B? You get AB. Oh, we're good. What happens if I intersect AB with BC? I just get B. Is there any intersection I can take to get something bad? Hmm. What's that? If I intersect CB with the second containing A, what do I get? We get Frank down there. Oh, 
All right, so we could come up with anything for the intersections. Hmm, maybe the unions. Let's look at the unions. What happens if I union the set BC with the set B? We get BC. Is that an open set? What happens if I union C with the empty set? You just get C. I cheated. Just C isn't an open set. I can only union open sets with open sets if I'm checking if it's a topology. I can't just pick anything I want. Don't let me just choose C. That's cheating. All right. What happens if we union BC with A? What do we get? If I union BC with A, we get ABC. Is that an open set? Yeah. Doesn't matter what union I take or intersection I take. We're good. So this is a topology. Okay, I'm going to give you three in a row. Let's check this one. Do we have the empty set? Yeah. Do we have the whole set? Yes. So the empty set's open, the whole set's open. What else is open? Let's see. Is the intersection of any of those sets an open set? Think so? What about the union? There's no BC. So the set containing B is an open set. The set containing C is an open set. But the set containing BC is not an open set. So this is not a topology. All right. This one was a topology. OK. So there's some examples of topologies. Hard to get intuition for. Seems like the most unmotivated definition in all of mathematics. Turns out it's stupid useful. All right, let's go over some examples of some topologies you can create. The topology that just has the empty set and the set X, whatever X is, is always a topology. Let's see, does it have the empty set in there? Does it have X in there? There's the first property. Take the intersection of any of those sets, what do you get? What do I get if I intersect those two together? The empty set, and that's right there. What do I get if I union those things together? The whole set, and that's right there. So we can intersect them, we can union them, and we're always getting open sets. So that's a topology. We call that the trivial topology. Pretty worthless one, doesn't give us much. Now we have another topology that's not very useful called the discrete topology. And that's the topology equal to the power set on X. Uh, the power set on big X is the set of all possible subsets. We just can't all, every single possible subset you could possibly make stick in the topology. Now it's a topology. Yeah, it's the biggest topology you can make. Is the empty set going to be in there? Is the empty set a subset of X? Yeah. Is the entire set X a subset of X? Yeah. If I union up subsets of X, what do I get? A subset of X. Maybe the whole set, maybe not, but it's just going to be a subset of it. I can't union up subsets of X and suddenly get more than X. Similarly, if I have subsets of X and I intersect them all, what can I get? Subsets of X. So it's a topology, the set of all possible subsets. We call that the discrete topology. This is the smallest topology you can make on any set. This is the biggest topology you can make on any set. They're both pretty useless. So topologies in between are somehow useful. OK, any questions on those before we go over to the whiteboard? Go ahead. I'll start with you. You're missing one of the subsets. It's not topology. If we take the power set and we just got rid of one subset, would it still be a topology? Uh, depending on the set you were talking about, there might be some special cases where you can do it. But in general, I think you're going to break it. 
You can write down your own concrete example and see it not working. Maybe we'll do it with this and see what happens. Uh, what was your question before I move it? Uh, is the idea behind topological spaces and continuity and calculus the same? Yes. So calculus, you are basically doing an analysis of the standard topology on the real numbers. The standard topology can we go over that again? We haven't gone over it yet. So we'll go over it when we get to it. Can you give me intuition for it again? The standard topology? I can next week. Because then we'll go over it. Because I need to go over what basis is. But it's the standard topology on... Yeah, so in calculus, you're just looking at a very particular topology. And we'll come up with a definition of continuity here. Give you a hint. Pre-image of open sets or open sets. Okay, there's a definition of continuous. Pretty image, easy to say in topology. And it turns out that's logically equivalent to your epsilon delta definition from calculus. For every positive number of epsilon, there exists a positive number of delta, such that if f of x is within epsilon of Oh, we'd have to say the limit as x approaches x naught. I need to write out. But so that big mouthful of a definition for calculus that you use for continuity, we can say it pretty succinctly in topology. So you see it's a specific case of topology, right? You can view calculus as just a special case of topology. Are there other special cases that we can Yeah, we'll do lots of special cases. Like, like we won't do as in-depth study as you do in calculus. No. Um, yeah, this field of study is one of the most unmotivated fields of study there is. I mean, the, even if I told you how the field started, it would make no sense with what it has to do with all this. But I can tell you how it started. It started with what was called the, I think it's called the seven bridge problem. And I think it was Gauss who was the one working on, the, who solved the problem. But there's some town in Russia, famous town, I don't know what it's called. Mark it up and draw. Some famous town in Russia, and there's seven bridges in the town. I don't remember how they're laid out, but it's like there's landmass over here, landmass over here, landmass over here. And the bridges are set up however they're set up. And it can't just be like that. Something like that. These aren't islands, they just go off. So it's like there's two rivers meeting here. So uh, something like that. Some town, here's two rivers flowing. There's seven famous bridges. Tourists want to be able to tour the bridges. But tourists are lazy. I don't want to have to walk over the same bridge twice. The question is, is there some path I can take where I go through the whole thing and only go over each bridge once? Now, with the combination I happen to draw here, the answer is yes. Maybe it was nine bridges for what they were doing, and the way it's set up, it turned out there was no possible path. It's really easy when there is a possible path, because you can come up with it and find it. When there is no possible path, that's a lot harder to figure out. Because how do you know that there's no possible path? You have to check every possible path. How many possible paths are there? Well, it just gives a stupid large number. So... Kind of like the uh, A little bit. I get the intuition there. But traveling salesman problem has to do with minimizing uh, distance between a bunch of locations. If I pull up the book here really quick, I can get the exact image of the bridges that was used. I think he goes over it right at the start of the book. Why was the field so unmotivated? Uh, it wasn't obvious what needed to be done in the field. So it started out, calculus was developed way before topology, and then people realized, hey, this notion of continuity here in calculus is kind of the same as this notion I'm working with over here. And some other guy says, yeah, it's kind of the same as what we're doing here. So they kind of come up with these more foundational definitions, foundational definitions, reverse backtracking all the way to topology, which seemed to work for all these many cases. And so they turned out to all be special cases of what we're talking about here, which was in no way remotely obvious to anyone. Uh, 
Come on. Two, four, six. Okay, it's a seven bridge problem. Oh, I only have five bridges up there. All right, here's what the problem looks like. It's easier to just redo the drawing. All right, so we've got the river. Why do I keep having this bad marker? Where did I put the good marker? There's my good marker. Okay, so we got the river comes down. There's an island here. And then the river splits off in this. Then we have bridge here, bridge here, bridge here. Bridge here, bridge here, bridge here, bridge here. And the question was, is there any way that you can cross all these, take a tour of the city, crossing each bridge once? And now we'll just kind of dumbly try it. And surprise, surprise, we're, our path's not going to work. So we start here, and we go like that, like that. We come around down here. Uh, oh, shoot. Hmm. And maybe we think, uh, oh, no, I don't trust Gauss. Maybe if I would come down this way, no, shoot. Uh, and then we can keep trying until we're blue in the face. Oh, maybe if I would have actually come down and around this way. And, oh, okay, now I got, now, oh, shoot. And it turns out, no matter what we try, it's not going to work. So there's one of the earliest problems that's related to the field of topology that was solved. Well, essentially, what they, they did that they Yeah, actually prove it rather than breaking down to this brute force try everything. And we actually proved this one. Did you do graph theory and discrete math? We proved it with graph theory. Is that you? I'll never remember that. <laughs> okay. Anyways, so historically very unmotivated, and uh, one of the things that led to research in the field taking off was actually Einstein's general theory of relativity. Yeah, so if you ever decide that you're going to go study general relativity, the mathematical object that you're going to be studying is called a space-time. What's a space-time? Well, it's a type of uh, differentiable manifold with a certain type of metric. Well, what's a differentiable manifold? Well, it's a certain type of manifold. What's a manifold? Well, it's a certain type of Hausdorff topological space. What's a Hausdorff topological space? Well, it's a certain type of topological space. And so... Uh, Einstein's work was helped push the field forward a lot, especially when we get to manifolds, the type of topology. Because that's what we use to model this universe now. We talk about the structure of the universe. We use a manifold. You can't just use plain old Euclidean space. It doesn't work. I don't know if you want to talk about the geometry of the universe. We can talk about it a little bit. So I'll give you some intuition for the geometry of the universe. Uh, first off, we got to think about plotting three-dimensional space into two dimensions. So, got to get comfortable with that because, unfortunately, I can't give you images of four dimensions. I only have three dimensions to work with. So, imagine that we plop all three-dimensional space down onto two dimensions. Then the universe, it turns out, is a lot like the surface of a balloon. We'll start with the surface of a sphere, and we'll work with that. So imagine that we collapse all 3D space on the surface of this Earth down to just two-dimensional beings living on the surface of the Earth. So now we're two-dimensional beings. No concept of up or down. There's just that way, that way, that way, and that way. Right? Now, if you were to ask me, okay, where is the center, then, of the surface of the Earth? The 
It sounds like a dumb question, doesn't it? Where is the center of the surface of the Earth? You can arbitrarily choose the North Pole. I mean, so that's pretty arbitrary. And so it doesn't really make sense to talk about the center of the surface of the Earth. That, it turns out, is, our, is a good model for how we model the universe. If we take three-dimensional space and plop it down, it's like we're on the surface of a sphere. And so it doesn't really make sense to talk about the center of the universe. And this is guesses from what we think the curvature of the universe is right now, but right now the guess is, assuming you travel much faster than the speed of light, you can actually go far enough in that direction that you come back and hit yourself. The same way you can go around the surface of the Earth. And now you've probably heard that the universe is expanding. Now it's not expanding in the same way that if I light a firecracker here, it explodes and expands out in space. No, 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 space itself is expanding. So now, don't think about us as being on the surface of a sphere, but rather on the surface of a balloon. And as you blow up the balloon, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, we say that galaxies are moving apart, but imagine I had a balloon and I drew two dots on the balloon. As I blow up the balloon, it gets bigger and bigger. Well, if you're standing at this dot, it looks like this dot's moving away. If you're standing at this dot, it looks like this dot's moving away. So that's what we mean by the universe is expanding. Space itself is expanding. And so we use a topology to model, to model that. So let's jump away ahead. Anyways, let's at least finish uh, this example, and then we'll come back with a proof next time. OK, so let's list all the topologies so one of the things I wanted to show you with what we were doing over here is given a set, there's no such thing as the right topology. There's a bunch of potential topologies you could have with a particular set. So let's take this set, very small set, just two elements, and let's talk about all the possible topologies we can create on this set. What are all the possible topologies? Go ahead. Yeah. You can start with the, the trivial topology. We can have the empty set and the set AB. Perfect. All right, there's one. What else can we have? The discrete topology. What's in there? What's that? So what are those? Don't make me think about it. I want you to think. You're, you're, you're just saying letters. We need to write sets. Tell me sets to write. The empty set, okay, that's a set. What up? The set containing A. The set containing B. And the set containing AB. Order doesn't matter in sets. In sets, orders doesn't matter. In ordered pairs, order matters. Okay. What else can we do? Yep. Now three. That's it. Is that a topology? Yeah. And then finally, Cal 4, same thing, but swap the A out with a B. So here's a concrete example of where you could start with the power set, remove one element, and still had topology. Okay. And so there's lots of different topologies you can have on a given set. And if I would have started out with a seven element set, instead of just a two element set, and had you list out all the topologies, 
assuming you have gotten them all, you have listed out 9,535,241 different topologies. So there's a lot of topologies we can have on a given set. How many topologies can we have on the real numbers? An infinite number. Calculus, we look at one of those topologies. The standard topology. Okay. Uh, maybe, actually, that would be a good example to come back with. We go over the definition of topology. Okay. So we can end it there. I will be uploading this to YouTube. I'll be sending out invites to the Facebook group to all your emails. Join that Facebook group will very much be worth your time. That will be the centralized way I try and communicate with you guys. Uh, any other questions about anything you want recorded? Cool. Call there.